Exciting news, ladies. You are officially invited. Yes, you, you're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. This is my 10-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the third week of September. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 378. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today, I'm sharing another episode in my summer series where I'm delving into the archives of the podcast and sharing some of the episodes that are still really, really relevant right now and also episodes that I share the most. And as a follow-up to last week's episode with Dr. David Brownstein and Dr. Dennis Wilson, I'm sharing my episode with Dr. Jorge Fletches. And again, going with the theme of iodine being the most controversial nutrient on the planet, I am sharing today's episode and ultimately what you'll find similar between the episode with Dr. David Brownstein and Dr. Jorge Fletches is that these are two medical professionals that actually work with iodine in the practice, meaning they actually test their clients and then they dose accordingly and they deal with any situations that arise accordingly. So it's, it's kind of how medicine, how, how you would think medicine would be ideally done. So instead of someone coming in and saying, well, all of my patients, I tell them all to take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D, you actually, you know, test the patients and find out where they're at and then dose them, test them again to see how well they're absorbing and then modify accordingly. It, like it, it just makes perfect sense. And I find that a lot of the practitioners out there who really warn against iodine are not themselves in their own practices actually testing their patients. And ultimately, if you're not testing, you don't really know whether or not your patient is deficient, similar to anything else, vitamin B12, iron, you know, we can list all of these nutrients. And in particular, when it comes to women's health, breast health, fertility, ovulatory health, it is really important that we look into some of these things because many women of reproductive age, or I could rephrase that and say, when we look at studies that are doing spot testing for iodine levels across populations, it's women of reproductive age and women postpartum who are most likely to be deficient in iodine. And in the fifth vital sign, I cited a study that showed that women who were deficient in iodine had a 46% or were 46% less likely to conceive in any given cycle. So from the standpoint of fertility, menstrual cycle health, ovulatory function, pregnancy, and postpartum, it's something that we really need to be looking into. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode with Dr. Jorge Fletches. And so without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Fletches. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very excited to have you here. I would love to hear a little bit about just your background and how you ended up specializing in iodine treatment therapy. I have a uh, master's in public health, and I've always been interested in the uh, issues of public health and now uh, what types of things we're uh, watching for. Back in the late 1990s, there was an article in the Journal for the American Medical Association 
looking at trace minerals and diseases that were showing up due to the lack of the trace mineral. I've been interested in a medical problem of fibrocystic breast disease, which most of us in the profession felt was due to the, the exposure to caffeine products. However, as it turned out, many of my patients that were taken off caffeine still develop problems with fibrocystic breast disease. In the article that was in the Journal for the American Medical Association, they pointed out that there had been an article published in the early 1990s showing that fibrocystic breast disease was due to a lack of iodine. I approached uh, Dr. Uh, Guy Abraham, a, a GYN endocrinologist in Southern California, about this situation, and I said, I wonder what other diseases are missing due to the lack of iodine. He sat there and said, I don't know either, but he said, oh, we'll put in some med line searches at UCLA Medical School, at the medical library, and he said, we'll find out if there's other diseases. Other, He said, most of what's known out there is you need iodine for making thyroid hormone. And he sat there and said, there's got to be something else going on that we're not accounting for. So when we gave, we looked at how to measure iodine, we looked at uh, diseases, and we found out that besides low thyroid disease being caused by low iodine, we found that low iodine was associated with low breast function. Low iodine was associated with low ovarian function and low iodine was associated with increasing risk of de development of cancer. The doctors uh, were up in the Great Lakes region where there was a lot of goiter. We found that besides the problem of iodine deficiency in the Great Lakes region, that there was an increased risk of development of breast cancer in the presence of having goiter. We then looked at what happens to people with goiters with time, and we found that there was a high incidence of thyroid cancer. So then we kept on looking, and we found that iodine deficiency was associated with ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, stomach cancer, and cancer of the esophagus. Once we got involved in this, we thought that we had captured something significant as far as looking into the fact that iodine deficiency manifests in many, many different ways inside the body. Well, um, you know, one of the things that I found and one of the, the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show to talk about iodine is, you know, iodine is the most contentious nutrient on the planet, it seems. <laughs> it seems as though there's nothing more controversial than iodine. And um, you already touched on how iodine is required to make thyroid hormone. Uh, but there's so many practitioners that will say that if a person has thyroid disorder with an autoimmune component, that they shouldn't be taking any iodine, essentially, because of the belief that iodine causes these problems. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit, the relationship between iodine deficiency and thyroid disorders. What we discovered is, is back at the time of Napoleon that they first discovered iodine. And it would be by the 1850s that they discovered that iodine could be used as a single element to help prevent development of goiter throughout the world. And it would be by the late 1800s, early 1900s, that we would finally make the association between iodine deficiency and problems with cretinism which is severe mental retardation in the presence of absence of iodine during a pregnancy. Nowadays, what happens is, is that we still have doctors who will fight us and think that taking iodine induces a goiter when in fact it is iodine that takes away goiters. We have since, there are committees throughout the world dedicated towards the study of goiter. We have learned since that a goiter is not just due to iodine deficiency, that it can also be due to lack of iron, that there is problems with goiter and people with beta-carotene deficiency or vitamin A deficiency. 
it's and there's goiter in in the presence of a selenium deficiency and a zinc deficiency. To think that iodine deficiency is the only source of goiter is we've learned is a misstep in the field of medicine. As a result, a lot of doctors, out of sheer ignorance, are telling patients that they should not take iodine because it's not good for them. And we're finding out that these doctors are have not been studying the medical literature. If they were studying it, they would find that their recommendations are dead wrong. You know, what I find interesting as well is the link between iodine deficiency and other issues in the body. Because there's definitely this this idea that really it's only your thyroid that needs iodine and it's the only part of your body that requires it. Uh, could you speak to just the way that iodine is distributed in the body and what other parts of our bodies need iodine for proper function? We have found that the body holds in totality 1,500 milligrams of iodine on uh, at a regular basis. The thyroid by itself can hold at maximum 50 milligrams of iodine. The average human being walking around the streets of the cities right now is has about nine or 10 milligrams of iodine in the thyroid. The thyroid, in fact, holds only maybe 2% of the total iodine in the body. Uh, 20% of all the iodine sits inside your skin. Lack of iodine to the skin, you get a problem of decreased ability to sweat, and the sweat mechanism is involved in iodine deficiency. 32% of all the iodine sits inside the muscles of the body. We've discovered that lack of iodine to the muscles causes problems with pain. And this is how we've discovered that one of the causes of fibromyalgia is iodine deficiency, and it's iodine deficiency of the muscle. 35% of all the iodine sits inside the fat cells of the body. And just as we see in the thyroid, in the thyroid, when you don't have enough iodine, you get a goiter with enlargement of the thyroid cells. Lack of iodine to the fat cells in the body, you get problems with enlargement of the fat cells. This medical problem is known as lip edema, L-I-P edema, E-D-E-M-A. And lip edema, if you look it up on Google or any search engine and uh, type in the word images, you'll see what lip edema looks like. And lipedema is basically goiter of the fat cells in the hips and in the legs, and it's due to iodine deficiency and it's and iodine's regulation of fat metabolism. We have found that uh, iodine is crucial towards maintaining the health of breast tissue and also maintaining the health of the ovaries and keeping them working normally. Well, could you tell us a little bit about, so what is fibrocystic breast disease? And like in your practice, how does it present in women? Like, I suppose, like, what does it feel like? How would someone know if they had an issue with their breast tissue? We have found that iodine deficiency will manifest as scar tissue in the breast. Iodine kills scar tissue. If you don't have enough iodine, then the body will start making a lot of scar tissue, and specifically in the breast, uh, that happens. A lot of women will have problems with painful breasts just before their menstrual cycle. The breasts will become very tender like a week or two before the period. This problem typically will go away within a few months of starting iodine therapy. Of interest is is that you can take other animal species, such as mice and rats and so on, deprive them of iodine, and they come down with the same medical problem in their breast tissue. So that uh, lack of iodine will manifest as increased scar tissue in the breast and painful breast and nodules of the breast. We see a common denominator in all this, that is, Lack of iodine in the thyroid, you get cysts, nodules, scar tissue, enlargement, otherwise known as goiter. In the breast, you will see cysts, 
nodules, scar tissue enlargement, and add to that pain. In the ovary, you will see cyst, nodules, scar tissue enlargement, pain in the ovary, and it all turns out to be due to iodine deficiency. In fact, in the field of surgery, we were told back in the late 1980s that once you do a surgical wound on somebody, such as cutting off a, a tumor from the skin or so on, and you put sutures in the skin to try to keep it, to, to hold it together, and then you, uh, we used to apply iodine on the wounds to keep them from uh, getting infected. We found out that if you put iodine on a freshly develop surgical wound that the two weeks later when you pull out the sutures that the wound will actually open up and that's because iodine inhibits the ability of the body to make scar tissue and that's true for the breast the ovaries the thyroid and the skin and so on so iodine is crucial in uh, just chronic inflammation and the development of scar tissue Eventually, we would discover that iodine inhibits the development of thyroid cancer. Iodine inhibits the development of breast cancer. Iodine inhibits the development of ovarian cancer. And it's all due to the fact that iodine is an inhibitory agent for development of cancer in all these different tissues. Well, and I want to ask you a little bit about the research in this area, because I know you mentioned the animal studies, and that's very interesting, obviously, that if you deprive uh, certain animals of iodine, that they go right along and develop essentially fibrocystic breasts, the animal version. But in terms of the research in women, I've seen a few studies that talk about iodine and this, the relationship between iodine deficiency and fibrocystic breast disease. Did you want to speak a little bit to some of the research that's been done in, in women? Uh, most of the research here was done by Dr. Eskin. He is a GYN endocrinologist at uh, Temple University up in Philadelphia. And Dr. Ghent, they were some of the first uh, people to show this, actually were able to find articles uh, dating back to the mid-1950s. And these were papers that were published in Russia, showing in Moscow, showing that there was a relationship between iodine deficiency and development of fibrocystic breast disease, cysts and problems with the ovaries and so on. Dr. Eskin and Dr. Ghent were the first ones to do a formalized study of uh, the use of different iodine preparations to show us that iodine will definitely reverse uh, fibrocystic breast. Mm -hmm. I suppose an interesting question, and maybe there's no answer to this question, but what do you think is the disconnect? Because I find it really fascinating that it wasn't that hard for me to find information in the scientific literature connecting a deficiency of iodine to fibrocystic breast tissue in particular. And it's so interesting to look at those studies because the results are kind of, you know how some studies you'll see like, oh, you know, 30% increase. And, but the, the relationship between fibrocystic breast disease and iodine is, is, is a lot higher than that, let's just say. What is the disconnect? Why is it that, why would you say that iodine just isn't a standard way to treat this disease in women? I think the biggest issue is, is that we're living in an area of medicine where the pharmaceutical industry is in control and they want us to use drugs for control of the medical problems that we have. And the problem is, is that iodine is a natural element that is not subject to patent uh, laws because it's a natural element and uh, people are scrambling throughout the nation trying to figure out how you can put iodine with something else to make it into something that you can slap a patent on and make a lot of money on it. And frankly, there's not a lot of money to be made in this field because this is something natural that can easily be resolved. When you get mammograms, you'll find out that mammograms where there is fibrocystic breast disease there is a problem with increased breast density. So on the mammogram, the radiologist will read it out as increased breast density 
seen on, ma on mammogram. And uh, we've discovered that uh, iodine helps to reverse this problem of increased breast density. And so usually it takes about anywhere from three to five years for the density to go down. We have since discovered that there is something even better than iodine for fibrocystic breast, and that's the use of lavender essential oil. Lavender contains a chemical in it called lanolol, L-I-N-A-L-O-O-L. -O -O and lanolol has the ability to destroy scar tissue. And if you take one teaspoon of lavender essential oil and you put it on each breast at bedtime, that within a period of uh, six months to eight months, that the increased density of the breast tissue will be reduced greatly. It works even better if you put the uh, lavender in connection with iodine. Being in practice for 35 years and, and working with clients with iodine, do you have any clinical stories of women that had moderate to severe cases of fibrocystic breast disease that you saw kind of in, in your own practice who were able to reverse with iodine? and in conjunction with any other treatments? There have been studies that have been done showing that iodine will get rid of approximately 50 to 90% of the scar tissue in the breast over a three to five year time period on repeat mammograms. The process can be accelerated even faster if you combine the use of iodine with lavender essential oil. Lavender, uh, there is inside lavender a chemotherapy agent called peril alcohol. That's spelled P-E-R-I-L-L-Y-L -L -L alcohol. And if you go to Google and type in the word peril alcohol and breast cancer and then use the word chemoprevention, you will find that peril alcohol has the ability to kill breast cancer and to be used as chemo prevention. That is, you put the lavender on the breast to prevent development of breast cancer. This is not George Flutch's talking. This is the National Cancer Institute and the NIH who have been doing studies on this since the 1990s. And they have pretty much proven and they know the exact mechanisms as to how lavender kills breast cancer. And we've been able to discover now that lavender has a chemical lanolol in it that has the ability to turn the fibrocystic breast disease, turn it around and make it into something that you can see it on mammogram. We just had a patient who's been applying lavender on her breast and taking iodine for the last eight or nine months. And she just repeated her mammograms that she had last year and she just recently had them a few weeks ago and her radiologist uh, read out that the increased breast density that was there is no longer there and that the uh, breast tissue is totally normal with no evidence of scar the increased scar tissue that's fascinating and also i mean very a very non-invasive type of approach i suppose you could say that's right one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is about ovarian function. So you mentioned that iodine is important for ovarian function and the deficiency of iodine can lead to cystic tissue. And so, you know, my podcast over the past almost three years, I've interviewed lots of health professionals and a few in particular, we've talked about polycystic ovary syndrome in those interviews, we talk a, a, a lot about the relationship between polycystic ovaries and insulin resistance and the whole process that's going on behind it. But maybe you could share if there's a link then between that issue and, I, and iodine deficiency. Dr. Abraham, who was the, uh, one of the original researchers with me, showed us that he used to specialize in PMS. He told me that if he had known what iodine could do as far as its ability to make the ovaries work more effectively, uh, he would have been using a lot more iodine in his early years of training for ovarian function. 
It's interesting that of all the tissues in the body, the ovary has the ability to make thyroid hormone. Just as the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone, the ovaries can also do that. And it's interesting that lack of iodine to the ovary, you get a lot of scar tissue. And Dr. Abraham was the first one to point out that the scar tissue will go down in size with us giving women iodine. And he pointed out to me that he had two or three cases where women had started taking iodine for PCOS and within a matter of a year were having regular menstrual cycles. They went from having a period every three or four months to having a period every 28 days. He had had the ability to uh, go in and take a look at with laparoscopic procedures. He could look at the uh, ovary and he saw that the scar tissue that was surrounding the ovaries was melting away in the presence of taking the iodine. So that today, I've been at this now with iodine for about 17 years, and I can truly say that out of something like 33 women who have polycystic uh, ovaries, that out of 33 women, uh, 30 have gone on to become pregnant. Dr. Abraham felt that that was a very significant number because infertility is so prevalent among our patients with PCOS. The issue of PCOS can pretty much be treated as if it were an iodine deficiency. When you treat the problem, you have an increased fertility rate that occurs. In fact, my latest patient with PCOS is a nurse from down in the Charlotte area. She just had her baby approximately uh, four weeks ago, and the baby is doing just fine. Mm -hmm. We know that there is an increase, and she had been trying to get pregnant for about five years, and it had no success. And once she started taking iodine, within six months, she was pregnant. Wow. Well, can I share a story with you? So I get my milk from a farm, and I was talking to my farmer, and he said something to me that kind of caught me off guard. I don't know how we got into this conversation, but he mentioned that he just kind of offhand because I think I asked him something about like you know how do you keep your cows fertile because here I am you know working with women teaching them how to chart their menstrual cycles and things and he said he's like I give them iodine every week and I was like oh yeah and then he said uh yeah if I don't give them iodine they get cysts and they don't ovulate (laughs) and I so I was just like, what? Oh, my goodness. So I'm talking to my farmer. And then he told me about some of the conferences that he goes to and the, you know, how they present information for farmers to support them and keeping their herds healthy and keeping their heifers ovulatory, because obviously that's their business. And then I did some research and it turns out there's all this research about how about cows and iodine and how they've got, they've done testing to see how when cows won't go into their estrus cycles they give them iodine and a large percent of them will go on to to start ovulating regularly so yeah that's when you talk about the success that you've had with women who have polycystic ovary syndrome polycystic ovaries and then you give them iodine i just couldn't help but think about what my farmer told me about his cows (laughs) i don't know have you kind of looked uh, looked at any of those types of the research that they've done on cows? Because I just find it to be so fascinating. I, I'm not acquainted with that research, but uh, our biggest interest with patients with PCOS is what happens to the children that are born where the mothers took iodine through the pregnancy. Mm. We feel that in Japan, the average Japanese woman takes 13.8 milligrams of iodine per day. And we've told our patients, look, the the least we could do for our patients here in America is to treat them as if they were a Japanese woman. And so we give them 12.5 milligrams of iodine per day. What ends up happening is we have now got In my practice, at least 55 babies that have been born where the mothers took iodine through their pregnancy. And it turns out that the children are very, very, very bright children. Our oldest one right now is 17 years old. 
She is a junior in high school. She started taking college courses in the fifth grade. She's already finished two years of college. She's making straight A's in her college work, straight A's in high school. She is uh, just a phenomenal child. But I would say, well, she's just a prodigy. But the problem is, is that we have basically been able to show that we have about 55 of these prodigies in our medical practice now. And that's just in my medical practice. Nationwide, we feel we have close to 5,000 of these children that have now been born where their mothers took iodine through the pregnancy. We did some research on why is it that iodine is so important in pregnancy. And it turns out that as the human being is developing, you have the central nervous system developing in a baby. And there is uh, in the brain what they call the neurons, which are the nerve cells of the brain. And then you have the support structures of the brain. These are called the glial cells. And iodine stimulates the making of the glial cells of the brain tissue. We would like to think that human IQ is stored inside the neurons. However, the research that's been done recently shows that human IQ is actually stored and developed inside the glial cell system. That's the exact same system that is being stimulated by iodine in the development of the brain. Now, there has been two studies that have been done. One was done in Mongolia, and the other one was done in Ecuador, where they deliberately went into these communities, and they gave iodine to women in one community, and then they went to a, a, another village right nearby and did not give them iodine. And then they came back 15 years later and checked the IQ of the children. And what they discovered was is that in the villages where the mothers received iodine during the pregnancy, the children had IQs that were 15 to 20 points above the children in the next village that did not take iodine throughout the pregnancy. So that there has now been two major studies, one in Mongolia, the other one in Ecuador, uh, showing that iodine will definitely increase the IQ of a whole village. And so uh, with that, I was intrigued with how, you know, how do we do with our own children? And it turns out that in my own medical practice, we have 55 of these children and they are, they're normal children. They love to play with other children. They, the only thing that you don't want to do is compete against these children or they will beat your hands down. All you have to do is show them one time how to do something, and they got it, and they can duplicate their experience with you on that one exposure. So that uh, these kids are just phenomenal. They learn very quickly. They get bored easily in classwork because the teachers are having to deal with so many children with attention deficit disorder. Well, it turns out that the Italians published a paper about 15 years ago looking at the problem of attention deficit disorder and they found out that ADD is actually an iodine deficiency disorder. And that when you give iodine to a community, to all the women that were pregnant in that community, that none of the children in the community would develop ADD later on in life. And where there was no iodine given to the pregnant women, the ADD rate uh, was almost 50%. Well, from the year 2000 through about the year 2010, the rate of ADD in this nation went up 700%. So that we think that there is a definite problem here in the United States with iodine deficiency. I'll tell you one of the problems that I see from a public health standpoint is, is that a lot of women think that if I take and eat sea salt, like Himalayan sea salt, Celtic sea salt, sea salt, sea salt, sea salt, that they will be getting iodine from the sea salt and that they will do fine. And we're finding out that there is no iodine in sea salt. There is no iodine in Himalayan sea salt. And it turns out that 
the companies are interested in this, and they're now starting to add iodine to sea salt. Of interest is, is that iodine is crucial towards maintaining the health of the human being, and the lack of iodine, you will get increased uh, mental illness as well as physical illnesses of the body. It's time, ladies. Time to take your fertility awareness, knowledge, and confidence to the next level. Just popping into today's episode to invite you to join us for the next round of Fertility Awareness Mastery Live, my 10-week group coaching program that's designed to help you unlock the secrets of your menstrual cycle. Fertility Awareness Mastery teaches you everything you need to know about using fertility awareness cycle tracking to achieve your intentions. Whether you're currently trying to get pregnant, avoiding pregnancy, or planning to conceive in the future, we've got you covered. This program goes deep. Get to the root of your period problems, hormone imbalances, fertility challenges, and so much more. Early bird registration is now open, but only for a limited time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash BAM, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash BAM. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. That's a really scary thought. It's the link then that you've seen in your practice and that you've spoken about in the research between iodine deficiency and intelligence. That's maybe because I live in Canada, because I don't know, I've never been tested for IQ. So I don't know if that, maybe that's something that's standard in the U the U S but it's, I don't think that it's something that's standard in Canada. So I, I get the concept of IQ, but to me, it's because I've never been tested and I don't even know anybody else who's been tested. So it's probably just not something that's standard in Canada, but it's, it's just very strange to think that our intelligence could be linked to this nutrients. And then the implications Uh, of that are really, it's almost, it feels controversial. The implications of that is very. Actually, actually in the United States, uh, every spring, we sit down and do IQ testing of all of our children for many grades throughout in California, Washington, Oregon, many places throughout the nation. And the children with the highest IQs in the nation are first generation Japanese children. They have, these are kids where the mothers are still serving them uh, seaweed two or three times a day at home as compared to third, second, third, and fourth generation children where they've learned to not eat seaweed. And the more seaweed that these Japanese children eat, the higher their IQs. And we have found that this is not only true in Japan, but it's also true in Korea. And in fact, the two nations that have the highest amount of children with high IQ is the Japanese and the Koreans. And so that, uh, and it all has to deal with the fact that these people are eating seaweed that is loaded with iodine, and the iodine is helping to give these people a very definite advantage uh, on the IQ range. Well, let's talk a little bit about so what you were talking about earlier 12.5 milligrams of iodine daily. All I can say is that this is the biggest controversy about iodine. And it starts with the RDA being 150 micrograms and 12.5 milligrams is so much higher. So, so many women feel very confused and also very scared to even consider adding something like that to their diet. I feel like with, with iodine, it's because there's so much controversy, people really just don't know what to do about it. Why is there such a huge discrepancy? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> between the amount of iodine that you're using in your practice and the official government recommendation? The official government recommendation is, is that they're trying to give you enough iodine to keep you from getting a goiter. It's just goiter management. And the problem is, is that the thyroid needs about 150 micrograms per day in order to keep the thyroid from goiter. As we've already pointed out, there are other tissues that need iodine, the breast tissue, muscle tissue, tissues of the uh, skin, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that these tissues actually need higher doses of iodine. 
And the U.S. RDA was based upon development of keeping the population from developing goiter. It was not developed to keep you from developing fibrocystic breast disease, polycystic ovaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's interesting is, is that when you go back in time and look at the studies that were done by Dr. Marine in Akron, Ohio, back in 1924, Dr. Marine looked at the issue of goiter in children. And what they found was is that uh, the ratio of a little boy to a little girl having a goiter was one to one. Once the girls got to puberty and started developing breast tissue and hips and all the fine features of women, the rate of goiter went from one to one to six girls to every one boy. And it turns out that uh, it would take us up until about uh, two or three years ago before we finally discovered that estrogen in the female body inhibits her ability to absorb iodine. The RDA does not account for that. And as a result, if you look at the issue of hypothyroidism, you'll discover that it's like 15 women to every one man who has problems with hypothyroidism. And low thyroid disease is due to the fact that women have all this estrogen, which is inhibiting their ability to absorb iodine. Now, what's also interesting is is that you will have doctors out there that say, oh, there's plenty of iodine in the salt, and therefore you don't need iodine because there's plenty of iodine. That's a misnomer. And the reason is is that 50% of all women in North America cook with no salt whatsoever or they cook with salt that has no iodine whatsoever. So to sit there and say there's plenty of iodine in the population is a misnomer because at least 50% of the salt that's being used contains no iodine by the women that are cooking with it. These statements that you've made are basically fallacies because you know they're based upon misinformation that's a well-known factors that are out there in the population right now. Flip side of the coin is, is that iodine is a halogen. And halogens have a tendency to go from a crystal into a gas and never become a liquid. So like, let's say we open up a box with iodine in the salt, and then we put the iodine in a salt shaker and we leave it on the table. And it takes maybe three or four months or three or four weeks for the salt and the salt shaker to be used. What you do not know is is that the iodine in the salt sitting there exposed to the air will evaporate so that a salt that's been sitting on the table for at least a month, 90% of the iodine will evaporate within that time period so that there's virtually no iodine in the salt within a month after it's been opened. As you can see, there are misnomers out there and there are problems with the, uh, you know, people not paying attention to the fact that the physiology and the biochemistry of how iodine works and so on. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because if anyone out there has ever used iodine, like in a drop form, you can test out exactly what you're saying. Because if you put a couple drops of iodine in water and you see the water change color and leave the water out eventually the water goes clear. So it does all go away. You're, yeah, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> it. Iodine, uh, iodine will do that. Like we have patients who will sit there and say, oh, I did the iodine skin test. I have plenty of iodine. Or I, have, I put iodine on my skin and within an hour the iodine was gone. Well, it turns out that when you put iodine on the skin, that within one hour, 97% of the iodine will have evaporated straight into the air. The iodine skin test is a very poor way of figuring out if somebody is iodine deficient. Well, as we bring our interview to a close, it would be nice to leave the listeners with kind of a where do you go from here type of scenario. One of the things that you just spoke about 
essentially is telling us that women as women we need more iodine than men and it, it seems as though like potentially orders of magnitude more just from what you were talking about with the goiter and how many girls who after they've gone through puberty have would have goiter versus boys and then obviously the the question really should be why do so many women have hypothyroidism and so i think it's very interesting how you frame that for us so how would one go about finding out if they're low or deficient in iodine and then add to that how would one then go about incorporating iodine into their day-to-day one of the best ways to do iodine checking is to do what's called the iodine loading test you can go to a website called hakala h-a-k-a-l-a hakala research lab and these people have the ability to do iodine testing to see if a person is low in iodine. If you have fibrocystic breast disease, I'll guarantee you, you got iodine deficiency. If you have polycystic ovaries, I'll guarantee you, you're low in iodine. If you have hypothyroidism, you're most likely due to iodine deficiency. Again, Estrogen inhibits the ability of the body to absorb iodine. And because of that, men on average need about uh, 12.5 milligrams of iodine per day. But women need about 25 milligrams a day only because the estrogen inhibits their ability to absorb the iodine. And this was not accounted for by the RDA when it was first developed. This is research that's been done within the last 10 years, but the RDA was never adjusted for the, uh, the fact that estrogen is an inhibitory agent of iodine in the body. Well, and for the listener who is Googling iodine and reading all the articles and, and seeing how most practitioners strongly advise against taking more than really the, R- the RDA. And so many practitioners will say that if a woman has a thyroid condition or anybody really has a thyroid condition, with an autoimmune component, that they should stay away from iodine altogether. Where can a person go to find a practitioner who's knowledgeable about iodine, who could help to support them in figuring all of this stuff out? A lot of the doctors who do integrative medicine are aware of the situation with iodine nationwide. And there's more and more family practice doctors who are now becoming aware of this situation also. If you want to look at the medical articles that I have published and that Dr. Brownstein and Mr. Hakala have published, you can go to Hakala Research Labs and their website, and you can find all the articles uh, that we have published, and you can download those articles and read it for yourself uh, and read all the references. There's plenty of references and there's plenty of medical articles to show that iodine is crucial. And what's interesting is, just in listening to your statement, most of us are focusing in on the thyroid. But, you know, when you look at iodine metabolism, only 2% of all the iodine can make it into the thyroid. 20% of all the iodine is in the skin. 32% is in the muscle. 35% is in the fat. And what's interesting is is that we're not even talking about these other illnesses that are there. Now, I'll tell you one thing that's interesting is is that I gave a lecture in uh, Southern California to about 1,000 patients with cancer. And I asked them, I said, how many of you have lost the ability to sweat? The sweat mechanism is due to the presence of iodine. If you don't have enough iodine, you can't sweat. And what's interesting is is that one-fourth of all the people who had cancer there in Los Angeles, one-fourth of them stood up and said, we've not been able to sweat for years now, and many of us are on our second or third cancer, and we can't figure out how we're getting all these cancers. And it's because of lack of iodine. And so... The issue is, is that we have just barely been scratching the surface of the illnesses that are due to iodine deficiency and some of the medical biases that we face in our medical practices 
from other doctors is what's taking our nation down as far as the health is concerned. I mean, this medical bias of not taking iodine, especially during pregnancy, I mean, lack of iodine during a pregnancy, you come up with a child who's got attention deficit disorder. But if you take iodine during that pregnancy, you'll turn up with a child that's a genius. I mean, how much further do we have to go with that? And how many articles and how many children do we have to damage before we finally figure it all out? Mm. You know, as you're talking about this, when you look into medical literature, there's a lot of different situations where a doctor would recommend kind of a therapeutic dose of certain vitamins and nutrients. So there's situations where the therapeutic doses of vitamin A are given to people. There's d- situations where therapeutic doses of vitamin D are given to people when they're found to be vitamin D deficient. And so I find it to be very interesting why there's so much controversy about iodine in particular when under you know medical care, there's so many different situations where the other thing too is that this is something you can test so from my perspective it's like okay well if we're doing science why don't we just do science you can test to see if a person is deficient and then you can act accordingly so you got it uh, it all I, I always kind of wonder about that why there's such a huge backlash around this particular nutrient because again we could just fall back on the science have the pr- practitioners trained in testing and and monitoring That's why I've recommended that you uh, go to Hakala Research Lab website and you can download the articles that we've published and all of this is covered in those articles. If you need medical ammo, there's the ammo. It's right there. We've been very interested to see how all of this is playing out, uh, especially in the medical community. Uh, Well, Dr. Fletches, I'm sure you could tell that I I could continue to pick your brain for the rest of the evening. But at some point, of course, I have to let you go to sleep. So I just want to thank you so much for being here. After everything we've spoken about today, is there anything in particular that you want to make sure to leave our listeners with today? All I can say is, is that it's important that when a woman gets pregnant, that she takes iodine through that pregnancy, because we can influence in today's world we can influence the next generation of children with their IQs just by putting the pregnant mother on iodine. You know, that's probably the most important statement I can make. And again, the amount of iodine we're recommending is the amount of iodine as if a person was a Japanese individual. The Japanese are eating 13.8 milligrams of iodine per day. We recommend that you take 12.5 milligram per day. And we've got literally millions of pregnant women in Japan and in Korea taking iodine at these levels and no abnormal babies. So anybody who tries to tell you that it's going to create abnormal babies hasn't studied the Japanese and Korean medical literature to find out that there is no problem with taking iodine at that level. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, where can our listeners go then to find more information about you um, and your practice? in anywhere you'd like to direct the listeners to? Well, you can just Google on my name. It's interesting that somebody took all my YouTube presentations and they translated them into Polish. And this past uh, spring, I was invited to Poland to go and speak before uh, 4,000 people. And when I talked to them, I said, how in the world did you guys find out about me? And they said, well, somebody put all your YouTube presentations into Polish, and now every one of us knows about you. Wow. <laughs> so, so I sat there and said, all right. What's interesting is, is that in Poland, the Polish people and the Germans are now forming iodine support groups to encourage women that get pregnant to take iodine through their pregnancies so that they can have very, very, very intelligent children. And that's... And until you go, you know, I became more interested in this when I went down to um, the Andes Mountains of Ecuador. We saw what severe iodine deficiency looks like. And these people have, I, the average IQ is between 90 and 130 people who are born to mothers where there was no iodine throughout the pregnancy. These people have IQs, they're called cretins, and they have IQs of 50 these people can't even talk. And I mean, 
when they try, try to talk to you, it's a grunt. It's, <laughs> and that's their speech pattern. And uh, that's severe iodine deficiency. The number one source of mental retardation in the world is iodine deficiency. So this is a major pro public health issue throughout the world, not just here in, uh, in the Americas. Mm. Yeah, that's, it makes you wonder why we don't know about things like that. But I, I suppose I have to wonder about things like that. And I, you know, you mentioned that the RDA was designed to prevent goiter. So we kind of give just enough to prevent any problems. Like we give just enough vitamin D to prevent rickets and we give just enough iodine to prevent goiter, which it's not even doing anymore because I'm sure you've seen people with goiters. <laughs> Well, the problem is we see goiter and so on, but the thing is, is that I'll give you a practical uh, problem here, and that is England. The British decided about 10 years ago to take the iodine out of their salt. And what's happened is, is that over the last 10 years, there has been an exponential increase in children having attention deficit disorder and cretins. In fact, England at this point is among the top 10 nations in the world with the least amount of iodine. And the British Health Services is finally coming to their senses that there is a major problem with iodine deficiency in England, and they just were not anticipating how much iodine they were not getting in their diet. Wow. Well, Dr. Fletches, you've given us a lot to think about. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here and sharing your expertise and your clinical experience and just helping to deepen our understanding of the role of iodine in so many different areas. I'm sure more areas than many of our listeners ever really thought about. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 378. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Fletches. Again, this is one of the episodes that I share regularly, especially when I have questions about issues related to potential deficiency of iodine, such as breast tenderness, fibrocystic breast disease, a variety of situations like that, as well as ovarian cysts and other cystic tissue type scenarios that are associated with iodine deficiency. This episode was really informative and hopefully gives you a different perspective. I don't really believe in dogma. I believe in doing what works and working with a scientific method, you know, as much as humanly possible. And that's why I love the menstrual cycle because it really does respond when we make changes. So if we have an issue with the cycle and we make certain changes to our diet and lifestyle and see the cycle improve, that's real world data of whether or not what we're doing is actually helping. And similarly, if you suspect potential deficiency in something, doing those tests, dosing accordingly, and then retesting to ensure that the doses are appropriate while being you know, monitored from a medical perspective with your healthcare practitioner to ensure that you're doing well and responding well, that's, in my opinion, kind of the best approach. So with that said, I hope that you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.